there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. I hope everybody's having a fabulous day today. Man, I came back from a quick trip down to Florida, and I came back to all the leaves on the trees, which is pretty awesome. I left, and there was still a little bit of snow in my house, came back, and uh, looked like summer had finally happened. Summer and spring happened all in one week when I was gone, so that's pretty awesome. Well, we have a special treat today. We have a double header today. We have Representative Tom McKay right now, and in a little bit, we'll have Representative Jamie Allard. Uh, Representative Tom McKay, man, you went down to Juneau and you fought specifically, I think, a lot for uh, resource development. But without further ado, I want to welcome you to the Must Read Alaska show. Well, thank you, Jonathan. And it's a privilege for me to be on today, uh, Memorial Day, uh, where we thank our fallen veterans. Uh, for all their, their great sacrifice for our country. So I, I kind of feel that this is a special day. And when we finish our session this morning, I'll be going down to the park strip for the ceremony that starts at 930. I love that. I it's Today is a very special day. It's one of the reasons, you know, we get to honor those who have gone before us and, and, and tragically sacrificed their life so that we can have a taste of freedom. And I think that that's something very special that we um, should continue to honor. So I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, Tom, one of the representative McKay, one of the things that I think folks saw on the tail end of session was just a crazy ending, right? Like it's, sometimes there's a crazy start to this, to session. It takes a while to get organized. Oftentimes we get a crazy and then ending walk us through for folks that weren't there, maybe just caught a couple blurbs and, uh, reading something in the ADN or Must Read Alaska. Walk us through your perspective on what happened there at the end. Well, uh, Jonathan, you, you know, uh, the the ending of the session had been staged and planned out ever since November uh, after the election by the Senate. As you know, the Senate organized quite quickly after the election uh, and, and 22, and uh, they had a 17 to 3 majority, which is a substantially large majority. They, they, they unified. They had a three-member minority that did, was hardly even placed on committees. And when they, when they hit session in January, they had the, the outline of the budget and uh, everything that was going to happen was pretty well uh, laid out uh, by that group. So as you probably recall, the house didn't fully organize until we got down to Juneau. Uh, we pulled in the Bush caucus basically to give us a majority. And so we had a very thin Republican led majority in the house and uh, we were going up against the Senate the, the whole time. So what happened at the end was, well, let me first say we passed according to traditional rules we passed our operating budget over to the Senate on April 17th. That was roughly 30 days, a full 30 days before uh, the end of the 120 day session. The Senate did not pass that budget back to us until uh, I think it was just one day before the session ended, mm -hmm. which basically violated all the traditions uh, in the legislature. And for your listeners and for everyone, you know, there's three sets of rules down there, basically. There's Mason's rule book, which is, you know, the rules that we follow on the floor. And then there's our uniform rules. And then there's traditional rules. And what you learn as a freshman legislator and a sophomore legislator like myself is the traditional rules are not written down. And the traditional rules can be broken. And the Senate definitely did that. They, they held on to the budget till the very end. They gave us no time to work, uh, work on a, 
a negotiated uh, uh, solution at the end. So what we ended up having to do was basically the governor had to call a special session, which would be normally 30 days. And we used one of those 30 days to complete the budget. And as you know, there was a, a, a big vote there and there was, uh, I believe it was nine of us uh, majority members that joined the house minority in voting to concur with the budget. Mm -hmm. Now that created a, a quite a firestorm in our caucus. There was a, a huge division about whether we should concur or not concur. And my uh, logic and rationale for concurring was because the Senate told us very clearly, you can sit here for 30 days in a special session and we're not gonna budge an inch. So my conclusion from all that was we were <laughs> they, not going And they had the suit, they have a super majority in their caucus. Oh yeah. yeah. We 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 had no we had run we'd run out of running room, uh Jonathan. If you can imagine a the quarterback hands the ball off to the halfback yeah. and there's there's no offensive lineman blocking, uh, he has nowhere to go, right? So he's basically gonna have to take a knee. We we had to you know, to me, it was irrational and, and borderline hysterical to continue to, with with very little to gain. We did, we couldn't we didn't have the three quarters vote to go into the constitutional budget reserve to to provide funding for a bigger dividend. The Senate knew that, and they so they stuck on their thirteen hundred dollar dividend number. And uh, you know, my other reasons for voting yes was. Uh, you know, the public hates special sessions. They think that right. we're down there just to collect per diem. So, and then the other thing is, you know, you rarely get, get anything accomplished. The, the conference committee uh, that would have been in place uh, on the Senate side would have been Bert Stedman, Lyman Hoffman, and Donnie Olson. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you so, basically just get much of the same. Yeah, stuff. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about a brick wall. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with all due respect to those gentlemen, you know, they so we would have just been in a very weak, weak position. And uh, my rationale and I think the rationale of the nine that, that joined uh, was we're not going to we're not going to gain anything here in this 30 days. Now, we could have went for a government shutdown. But the public hates that, too. They think it's chaos. And they also don't care about our internal squabbles. If I come back to my constituents and say, well, the Senate was mean to me. Yeah, that's, you know, yeah. they're just going to say, well, you know, toughen up buttercup and go yeah. back and try again, you know? So the, the whole thing, uh, you know, we just, I just had said, I got to pull life support on this deal. Our caucus was badly split arguing. Uh, like I said, there was people that were borderline hysterical. They were irrational. They weren't thinking clearly. And I, I just said, I got to vote yes to get us out of here. So now, what was the temperature like down there? Was it the Senate's being disrespectful to the House or was it just like, well, you kind of outmaneuvered us? They just outmuscled us, you know, they just and yeah, they're disrespectful. You can use all you can use all the adjectives you want to use. Uh, but it's hardcore politics. And, uh, you know, the conservatives, until we get more conservatives elected, which I'm dubious about with ranked choice voting, frankly, uh, I don't see much changing. I could, I could see this happening again. And um, the House majority is going to have to hold together, and we're going to have to go back down there next, next January with a, with a pretty tough plan on how we're going to avoid being outmuscled by the 17 member majority uh, Senate. And uh, you, you don't have many tools available to you. It will be interesting to see what the governor does. Um, he's got 20 days, I believe it is, from the time we voted, which was about May 18th, I believe. Yep. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what he vetoes. He, he could possibly veto the whole thing and call us back and make us start over. And what people, what I want people to understand is we are a bicameral legislature. There's the House and the Senate, and they're supposed to be equal. And this, the Senate did not 
treat us equally in the, in the 120 days that we were down there, that's for sure, when it came to budget matters. And like I said, the general public, they're sort of like, well, go go fix it. They don't want to be bothered with it, right? Yeah. They just want us to get our work done in 120 days, no special sessions, the internal squabbling, you know, they would rather not hear about it, you know? So that's our predicament. That's why I voted yes. Uh, I normally would have been a no vote. Uh, and I think in my district anyway, uh, they don't like extremism. Yeah. Uh, my, my district doesn't, doesn't uh, I don't they they would not be happy with a government shutdown, uh, so I guess that's a pretty that's a pretty pretty good uh, encapsulation of how I looked at the whole situation, and uh, why we needed to come home. And yeah, I think that there's you know with any of that stuff there's ups and downs, and ultimately, I think the Senate put the House in a very tough situation where. Yep. You don't really have too many amazing options at that point. And I guess it's a live and learn kind of thing. And, and uh, I think you could just go with your gut. Like you said, you, at the end of the day, you have to represent the people in your district. And I think your district, just like you said, is probably just, you know, center right. And they don't want to see folks extreme on either side. And, uh, you know, at the end, and also, you know, you have done a good, you know, this year, I think, Representative McKay, I've heard, I heard a couple of um, your conference committee <laughs> sessions and man, you don't hold back. You, uh, <laughs> you know, there was one set, there was one session, resource think, committee. Yeah. Yeah. There was one session yeah. where there was some engineer trying to like, um, I don't know, uh, get on her little podium and talk down to you and you weren't having none of it. So I think that even yeah. though there's, even though it ended not awesome, you're still there for uh, months representing Alaska and doing the best that you can to, to help resource development. So let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about this carbon um, situation where the governor's got a couple bills. I think one of them passed or they yeah. both passed about well, what, sequestering yeah, so, carbon. Yeah. So there, so it is a little complicated and I don't want to, you know, sound like, oh, I'm all, a genius about all this but there at the beginning of session there were two carbon bills submitted by the governor one is for injecting co2 into our um, uh, depleted gas reservoirs in alaska which we have several and that's called the carbon sequestration project okay car and the the slang term easier to say is carbon storage yeah so there's carbon storage jonathan and then there's a completely different bill was the tree bill. I call it the tree bill, which is where you set aside uh, hundreds or thousands of acres of uh, forest on state land that can be used for what they call carbon offsets so that companies can uh, have CO2 producing projects, but basically buy credits towards, towards woodlands that would theoretically uh, convert that that carbon. So there's there was two different bills, two entirely separate bills. We worked on them extensively in House Resources. Uh, what's interesting about the carbon storage bill is we need that. We will need that if we if we ever going to build a gas pipeline. Because you have to you have to scrub out and do something with the CO two uh, on the North Slope before the before the natural gas gets shipped uh, down the down a proposed pipeline to uh, what is now referred to as Nikiski. Yeah. So you need to be able to uh, pump pump the CO2 into these depleted gas reservoirs, which we have plenty of those. We've got a lot of room for this CO2. So it's really quite simple. We have to have a framework so that the companies, whoever builds the pipeline and the operators on the slope at Point Thompson and Prudhoe, can, can inject the CO2 into these reservoirs. So that's what the carbon storage bill, frankly, I thought it was quite simple. Our resources committee passed that out and uh, that, that went over to the Senate. And then of course the tree bill, we spent a lot of time talking about the tree bill, about how it's not tied to ESG, it's not tied to the World Economic Forum, it's not 
It doesn't lock up anything. You can still do all the activities uh, in that particular plot of forest that, that you normally could do. And it actually, uh, we, th <clears throat> we thought it would enhance things because you, uh, you're actually encouraged to go in and, and uh, manage the forest better. Uh, in particular, uh, clean out beetle kill uh, trees. And some of, this, yeah. some of these fees could pay for, you yeah. know, XYZ company now has to manage 10 million acres in the middle of yeah. nowhere, and they have, to, they have to manage it as part of that fee. Yeah, and so what, what do we do right now? Well, well, our forests, they catch on fire, and we just basically stand there and watch them burn. Yep. So the governor's argument was, let's, let's at least get some value out of our, our stranded forests and, uh, and allow our companies, especially Alaska companies, ConocoPhillips, Hillcorp, Santos, um, whoever else that wants to uh, participate in these programs. By the way, it was all voluntary. And the other thing, the other thing to remember is the native corporation. There's some native corporations in Alaska, and the mental health land trusts that are already engaged in these programs. So the the state is actually behind the eight ball and trying to catch up. So let me shift gears. Then those bills went to the Senate. Yep. And then the Senate did kind of a weird thing, but they they uh, they actually passed the tree bill with some carbon storage uh, aspects within it. So I, I kind of wish they'd kept them kept them separate because it it gets confusing when you mix them together. You know, carbon storage and the trees are just two two entirely different things. Anyway, they mixed them together in one bill. I believe it was. Uh, SB 48, which is the bill that the governor signed last week at the energy conference. So if uh, there's companies out there willing to buy these credits, is that a fair thing to say? They are These companies already exist around the world. Yeah. And yeah. we have the technology to pump this yeah. stuff into, you know, what I'm guessing is underground empty caverns. Well, you you have uh, you have gas reservoirs like in Cook Inlet. There's depleted gas reservoirs, right? Yeah, they have uh, tons of uh, vacant pore pore space that you can in inject this CO2 into, and likewise on the slope. So the other, the other thing about a gas pipeline, Jonathan, and I'm, we're pretty excited uh, because of the war in Ukraine. And because of some of the things that are happening in the Asia Pacific region, suddenly Japan and South Korea are, uh, I've been told, and this was mentioned last week in the energy conference, Japan and South Korea are very, uh, get, becoming very concerned about their uh, stable supply of LNG. And suddenly the Alaska pipeline for, for gas is looking at, you know, at those two countries as potential very large customers because uh, because Russia has basically alienated themselves because of the Ukraine war. And I'm also told that oddly enough, Australia, who is a major exporter of LNG, has become so concerned about climate change and they believe that climate change is real that they're actually uh, starting to starting to decrease their export of LNG, which to me is it's like one of the sense, greatest forms of energy out there. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I, I worry about the what's going on in Australia and New Zealand as we saw during COVID, how they treated their citizens. But uh if they if they want to go out of that market, I think Alaska should say, hey, we're we're here and we're ready to do business. So it, the the stars are maybe starting to get a little more aligned on, on a gas pipeline for Alaska because of these global geopolitical factors. So this this bill that the governor's passed, do you think that this could we could reap some benefits and rewards? You know, is this like five years or less, ten years or less? You know, a couple years or less? How quickly do you think that the state and some of these companies can? you know, we can start seeing some revenue from this as a state. I think at the absolute minimum, if you've really fast-tracked 
things, it's 18 months to two years. Um, but since we're just getting started on it, my, my guess would be it might be a little longer than that. And you, you just, you touched base on it a little bit. You recently went to this energy conference, I think put on by the governor's office. Yes. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. You had some, you had some celebrities there, Aaron Brockovich. You had the former mayor of Chicago there who was, I Brum. think Bo Obama's former chief of staff too, or campaign a, manager, maybe the, maybe both. Um, yeah. Ra Rahm Emanuel. Yeah. So talk Rahm to me, Emanuel. talk to us about that conference for folks that, yeah maybe didn't go or haven't heard anything about it yet. Well, Rah Rahm Emanuel, as you just said, is former mayor of Chicago. He was Obama's chief of staff, which is a pretty powerful position. He's now the ambassador to Japan. <clears throat> and, he, and he's made friends with uh, Governor Dunleavy. <clears throat> and of course, he's a, to be honest, he's a pretty hardcore Democrat. Mm -hmm. But he understands international politics and he understands natural resources and, and strategic advantage. And he, he was a pretty strong advocate for Alaska uh, exporting LNG to Japan and South Korea. And that we could, uh, you know, that would benefit the United States and, and let's say the, the free world. And so it was an interesting talk to have him up there with the governor. And, uh, you know, the, like I said, bi bipartisan discussion, I guess you'd call it. And, uh, you know, I look back, I remember when the Alaska pipeline was approved, the, the TAPS. TAPS was approved by one vote. And you, yeah. you know who that was? It was, the, it was Vice President Agnew because it was a tie vote. It was 50 to 50. And Agnew cast the, uh, the 51st vote to get, the, uh, to get TAPS built. So we we barely had federal government position uh, permission to build taps way back in the I guess it would have been the late sixties early seventies, um, and um, you know so here we are again you know trying to get a gas pipeline and it's it's a lot of challenges. So do you think um, the LNG project happens? I mean, there's you know what this is we're going on year what twenty or whatever it's been a oh, long I know. time. Yeah. We have, I know. Uh, you know, yep. 600 million pages of paperwork and about yep. that much spent already on engineering and FERC approvals and all that kind of stuff. So if you had a crystal ball, what do you, what do you think is going to happen big picture with the LNG project? Oh, I'd hate to, I'd hate to even speculate, I guess, you know, there several things have to come together. You have to have a, you have to have the buyers, the, the long-term contract buy, buyers to buy gas. And then of course you have to you have to build the project for the for the cost that you say you can build it for, which I think right now is forty two billion dollars. It's the latest yeah. estimate. And then you have to have the the producers on the slope agree to sell the gas and ship it down the pipeline. Now I happen to be a petroleum engineer, and you know there's something that they call blowdown, and blowdown occurs in a in a Oil, oil reservoir that's late in its life where it, it becomes more economic to sell the gas rather than use the gas to maintain reservoir pressure and get more oil out. Now, for example, Swanson River on the Kenai Peninsula is, is in blowdown. Mm -hmm. The gas is more valuable than the remaining oil. Now, when will Prudhoe Bay go to blowdown? <laughs> That's a huge decision for ConocoPhillips, Exxon, and Hillcorp, the, the three principal owners of crude oil, plus the Alaska Oil and Gas Commission. They have to also approve when you when you make that transition. It's a huge decision. It's basically saying, Jonathan, we're going to leave the oil behind now, yeah, and we're going to basically convert Prudhoe Bay to a gas field. So I don't know when that year will happen we do have gas of course at point thompson which which could be the the beginning of a pipeline project uh supply and uh and then it, then the question is when would prudo go to blow down and and um uh, those are huge decisions for those companies because you know for obvious reasons yeah 
Well, our uh, man, our 20 minutes or so went by very fast, Representative McKay. I appreciate you. Wow, that was fast. Coming on the Must Read Alaska show. Any last minute things to share? Um, you know, folks, you know, um, maybe folks that live in your district are going to listen and they're, you know, wondering, maybe somebody just moved in and they're wondering what's the easiest way to get a hold of you. Tell us all those kind of details and and uh, any last minute things you can you can think of. The mic is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, well, you know, I have we all have uh, the Anchorage area legislators have offices in the LIO, uh, which is located at uh, what is that Benson in Minnesota mm -hmm. in uh, what's called the Wells Fargo building. And, uh, you know, you can just Google Google us and uh, I'm District 15, which is uh, Bayshore, uh, Campbell Lake and Sand Lake. And, uh, you know, I have I have one more. Well, I have one more session in my term, which would start in January. There is some talk that maybe we would go back in October uh, for a special session on the long term fiscal plan, which we haven't. We haven't touched on that, Jonathan, but yeah. um, I would just close by saying to folks that, you know, our state right now financially is um, we're, we're headed towards a problem because we're running out of savings. We're running out of accessible savings to fund uh, government. And uh, right now we're it's about 50 50 uh, rough numbers. Uh, funding government from uh, pr production down the pipeline and and from our savings, uh, primarily the uh, permanent fund earnings reserve. So there's some really big decisions that are starting to come before us on how we're going to fund the government and what level of government do we want to have. And uh, it's, it's, it, it's quite a difficult exercise with 60 people in the legislature. To, to come up with some kind of uh, unified plan that everybody can agree on, which would include taxes, spending cuts, uh, a spending cap, and, and a protection of the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend. Those four items come together like a, like four, if you can envision four trains coming together <laughs> from four different directions at high speed. And, uh, you know, it's just going to be a... <laughs> it's just it, it's very difficult and I, I i can tell you that uh sometimes it's not not a whole lot of fun to be honest yeah well i appreciate the work you're doing representative mckay i know that uh it can be daunting and draining but um i think it's a great thing that you're on the your chair of the resource committee as a as somebody who's pro resource development so i appreciate all the work you do and, like i said uh, in our at our beginning the, the easiest solution to all these financial problems is more production yeah well uh that is it for time folks i appreciate you joining us representative mckay you're welcome back on anytime um and uh for folks who want to help keep the lights on here at must read alaska you can go to mustreadalaska.com on the right hand side there's a little donate donate button for every five dollars ten dollars a hundred bucks helps keep the lights on here at must read alaska we're not funded by some dark web nonprofit money conglomerate. We're just funded by everyday folks in Alaska who care about conservative news. So until next time, I'm John Quick from somewhere in Alaska. Thank you.